Well, Lori, it is so nice to be with you. Um, it's been over a year since you've been at IFM, um, but certainly we've been in contact and you have been doing so much in the ecosystem um, with virtual practices. It's been fun to see and be able to continue our partnership together. Um, and I'm delighted to have a chance to talk with you about the last 30 years and really sort of looking back with the vision of looking forward that um, we're talking about so much right now at IFM. So I thought we might get started with just a quick thought around um, a reflection of the last 30 years and what it meant to start developing the curriculum and how that development of the curriculum led to engagement of practitioners thinking about where we are today. Mm. Well, thanks, Amy. It's, um, it's a pleasure and a delight to both be with you and have this opportunity to, to talk and reflect and also to celebrate now 30 years <laughs> of, of IFM. So yeah, I'd love to, to talk just a little bit about that process, the, both the development process. And of course, you know, as you said, looking in the rearview mirror, it's much easier uh, that the path that was charted uh, by Jeff and Susan in the very early 1990s, I certainly couldn't have anticipated. But really, I, I think about it in three 10-year chunks. So that first 10 years, um, Jeff and Susan launched the first international symposiums, and they were really intended as gathering think tanks to see, is there something here? You know, what, what are these concepts? how can, and principles, and how can they be built out? So those first two international symposiums, as you know, happened in 1993 and 94. Then in 1998 was the first AFMCP. And uh, as Jeff Bland is fond of saying, those early AFMCPs, you could have fit all the attendees in a phone booth. I mean, now we can't even find a phone booth, but you, you get the analogy. So those were two huge, um, monumental milestones in that first decade. The second decade brought in, in 2001, IFM becoming a nonprofit education organization and things like ACCME accreditation. But it became very clear that AFMCP and the International Symposium occurring once a year were not enough for clinicians to be able to really go more deeply into this material and apply it in their practices. So I would say the next huge milestone that happened was in 2004 and 2005, 2004, the second edition of the clinical nutrition textbook came out. 2005, the textbook of functional medicine. I still look back at that. I looked at the textbook the other day. It, I think there were over almost 50 contributing authors, over a thousand pages, a massive number of references, a huge, Herculean lift. David Jones used to say, well, even if a lot of copies aren't out there, it's a good thud factor. You know, you drop it on your foot and you're, you're going to notice it. So that was enormously <laughs> important. But again, not sufficient for the kinds of demands and requests that the organization was continuing to receive. So um, in the late 2000, that next 10 year period of time, 2009, the first advanced practice module was offered and the vision for the certification program, which then really leads into this last decade that, uh, you know, that you can talk much more about uh, uh, the latter part of it. But the first IFM certified practitioners, you know, in 2013. But when we look at those as like individual sort of stakes in the ground, an international conference once a year, AFMCP a couple times a year, these modules, what we realized is we were building um, to the advancement of practitioners who were already well steeped. So we then started coming back around and saying, how do we engage practitioners who want to dip their toe in the water, want to understand some of the foundational concepts and principles and see whether this resonates and if they're interested. So we began developing some very short form e-learning courses that focused on really the two big pillars of functional medicine and functional nutrition. Um, to try and build what became an entire journey map and engagement pathway for clinicians. Well, um, it's interesting to think about that pathway, which I love the description. And each time I hear it, I actually learn a little bit more about it. So it's nice. Thank you for sharing it. It is interesting to think about that pathway. Think about the strategic plan. 
Um, when I started, which is now almost four years ago, which doesn't seem possible, but almost four years ago, you, you handed it to me, literally handed it to me and said, this is where we're going. This is where we're going. You know, you need to settle into your job and start moving us there. And that move us there, little did we know, actually, was going to put us at 2020, at a talk about 2020 looking back vision, a time when we would be finding a different way for where IFM could have an impact. But you, you, you sort of almost knowingly set that up in the development of the strategic plan because you were starting to envision that the role of IFM as an educator needed to be something more. So can you talk a little bit about sort of that thinking and the strategic plan development and the ecosystem and share a little bit about that today? Sure. And it was an enormously uh, both creative and productive process of the development of that plan. And there were others who were very much involved in that kind of thought creation around where to go and what to publish. But I think at the most basic level, uh, for me, what became clear is that IFM had spent a lot of time trying to mature and develop uh, the curriculum. And that was uh, really a singular focus that had a high bar, high standards, uh, you know, the kinds of accreditation that would generate credibility and bring people to, uh, you know, to join in and, and be engaged and interested. But what became clear is that we had, that there was an ecosystem. We had never really articulated the, P, the components of it, nor had we published our understanding of what that ecosystem both looked like and how to define it and the roles that the various partners and collaborators played. And after publishing it, this was one of the things that I would not have known, but I love these aha moments that I knew it was very important for IFM to be able to understand we had to be looking outward much more. Um, what I didn't appreciate until that next year was how important it actually was for all of the partners and collaborators in the ecosystem. Because for maybe for the first time, they could see their role in the ecosystem. Of course, they were all developing their own strategic plans and business plans. And they had a focus on their vision of, of both what was needed and what maybe an ecosystem looked like. But for the first time, we articulated something that said, this is our understanding of who we all are and how we fit and the work that is needed to do together. And it became, I think, a galvanizing moment for something that we then referred to as the functional medicine movement. Mm -hmm. And the functional medicine movement is um, certainly alive and well today. You saw that vision. You could, um, you knew that was something that needed to happen for functional medicine and the widespread adoption of functional medicine to really take hold and take shape. Um, I think a lot about that um, terminology movement and um, and the terminology ecosystem and. You and I, over our four years together, have talked a lot about words and yeah. what words mean and well-placed words, words sometimes, and we know this certainly in our discussions about health equity and racism, words that actually can hurt. Um, so maybe you could share a little bit more, and, and, and I'll um, provide some context too, about kind of that word movement and that word ecosystem and how they were really right for the beginnings of that, um, as you said, maturing and evolving of an organization and the work we're doing and where that is today. Yeah, yeah, that's a, a beautifully said and teed up, Amy, so thank you. Yeah, you and I have talked a lot about words and we've <laughs> agonized uh, over words and we've laughed <laughs> over words, but um, for me, words are intent, they're intended to be dynamic and, to, and they're not perfect often. Um, but they're intended to serve something that's important and significant in the moment. And so both of the words that we've already mentioned, ecosystem and movement, were, were important and were used liberally in the strategic plan and in the vernacular uh, you know, at IFM. 
but they weren't perfect. Some people, you know, it took um, having people understand what we meant actually by ecosystem and that we weren't literally talking about, a, you know, an environmental ecosystem, but <clears throat> it did bring up some of the very important uh, core foundational definition of an ecosystem, you know, these interrelated symbiotic parts, that was important. Um, movement, there were very definitely people who objected to the term movement because it, it felt either political or maybe even uh, too strong or aggressive. But again, mm -hmm. what we were trying to articulate and to, to share in a word is that it's much, it's about much more than any single organization or, or company, that it's about all of us coming together and galvanizing around some common vision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, when I think about um, where that word movement sits with us today, um, I think when you and I were talking earlier, uh, I used the terminology, it's almost as if the word movement provided a container, a place for us to put vision, a place for us to put ideas, a place for us to um, be galvanizing, such a good word, galvanizing a core of um, individuals, practitioners that believed in one really important thing, which was that the health of the patient was why they came to work every day. The, um, and that the health of the patient was um, central in the work that they did every day, but might not be central in the way they were being forced to do it in a more conventional system. And so where we sit today thinking about the role of functional medicine, pointing toward transformation of healthcare, frankly, living through the um, twenty, the year of 2020 and the COVID pandemic, um, we're also learning that root cause medicine, so functional medicine, root cause medicine, fared pretty well in that time frame, and that um, in fact, root cause medicine and really um, looking at lifestyle, looking at the way we're building up our immune system or repairing our immune system, that resilience those words all bubble up. And we've been talking about them in functional medicine for 30 years, right? But now they bubble up as something about the vulnerability of our society and how we need to be um, understanding that all the way from nutrition and nutrition insecurity to um, the way we are treating our patients and how we develop that relationship. So I love, um, you know, I actually miss the times when we get to talk about words because um, the words that we're using right now, we know have such a great impact on, and as I said earlier, everything from health equity and the engagement with the patient, the engagement between practitioners and how a practitioner can come to one of our programs, learn about functional medicine, and how do we equip them to feel comfortable with the right words to go back and talk about that experience with their um, colleagues that might not be, um, have been interested and learning about functional medicine. So the development of words, the putting together of the right words, the development of a call to action, something we're talking a lot about with AIC coming up, which is exciting. Amy, the work around partnerships and strategic collaborations was called out in 2016 in the strategic plan and has been something that uh, I know I worked hard uh, to try to advance but you are now taking to an entirely another level. So can you talk a little bit about what you see happening both right now and what you think is needed in terms of partnerships and collaboration uh, as you go forward into the fourth decade of IFM? Thanks. I, um, I really appreciate you actually teeing up that question. Um, one of the things that excited me about the strategic plan when you handed it to me was that the need for collaborations was clearly called out. The need for partnership was clearly called out. And to me, that's symbolic of an organization that realizes the work that they are meant to do, the work that they should do, but the work that they also want to do in partnership with others, that actually no organization should try to do everything. Um, we used to call it in city government, we used to call it the yellow book test. And we would say, if, there's, if you can flip through a big old yellow book 
and find a whole section that's devoted to that particular skill, you probably don't need to create another organization doing that same thing. So where that positions um, IFM and functional medicine um, today is we're really grounded in the work that we need to do. We're continuing to build that curriculum. We're continuing to build the evidence base that we know that we need, but we aren't a research institution. We aren't a health institution. We aren't a um, hospital or an academic institution. And yet we know that we have something that we could bring in partnership to those organizations. And we know that we need those organizations to be fully grounded in some of the concepts of functional medicine as well. So we um, last year really built out for the first time the um, Strategic Partnerships and Innovations Department. And the role of that department is to seek out partnerships, both domestically and internationally, that can bring forward the concepts of functional medicine, but do it in a way that supports that organization and supports the broader mission. So think about it this way. Um, we have a hospital right now, a large hospital system that we're working with. Their practitioners have said to the, the leadership, we actually have learned about functional medicine and we know that if we had the concepts of functional medicine and can integrate those into our conventional acute care, that we could provide better care for our patients. And, and what I love about this, it's the and, and practitioners would feel like they had a better set of tools to provide that treatment, which would enrich them every day. So, that true enrichment of the patient experience, putting that patient first, but realizing that the only way that works is when a practitioner truly feels like they have the right tool set to be able to do that work in a way that is fulfilling to them. You know, we talk a lot um, in management. We, you know, you and I are both avid readers of HBR, right? We're like, oh, we can't wait to get to that next edition of the Harvard Business Review. And that's all management. And we kind of think about it. Well, that's companies. Well, each of our doctors, each of our practitioners, nutritionists, they're running their own business. They're running their own shop and they need management support. In many ways, the tools that come through functional medicine training, they provide that set of tools for them. Here's how to think about the, uh, the illness that your patient is experiencing. Here's how to think about the imbalance that you're finding. Here's the set of tools that allow you to do that in the context of your conventional setting. So what I love is where it used to be sort of functional medicine, we are now saying, how does functional medicine integrate in? How does root cause personalized medicine integrate in and become a part of how patient treatment happens? The last thing I'll add to that, you know, one of the, one of my favorite things that um, Jeff Bland is saying right now is that when he talks to a physician that's not been trained in functional, integrative, personalized medicine, he will say to them, do you believe that lifestyle medicine is important? And across the board, they say, well, yes, I do. And then he says, do you, do you know how to provide lifestyle medicine and talk with your patients about lifestyle behavior? And many of them say no. That piece, we can change. So we can, we can further provide that support, that management level support that they need to be able to do good medicine. We're able to bring that now into um, hospitals. We've started this really um, exciting partnership and are looking for more of those. Each one of those partnerships can then lead to research that's happening. And again, it's not us doing the research, but we can provide the curriculum to train the practitioners to be able to participate and bring patients through that research. Um, and then I think the piece that has evolved so much over the last year, and you know, we're um, really close to the anniversary of the um, death of George Floyd and the, um, the true movement that, um, that started around um, just, just after Memorial Day 2020, um, and really bringing forward the necessity of us digging in and being serious about racism as a public health crisis and the importance of health equity 
and that it doesn't mean, um, you know, uh, we're going to give you a handout for how you're going to be receiving your medical treatment. It means actually giving the best care to every individual patient. Um, and there is a real role for functional medicine. There's a real role for our organization in that space and for other organizations that are our peer organizations. Just last week, the AMA actually released their guidelines around how the medical community needs to settle in and realize our role and our real responsibility in the space of health equity and ending racism. And I feel really excited. This AIC that we have coming up has the most diverse um, speaker panel that we've ever had. And there are deep to topics that take us into discussions around health equity and racism, um, unconscious bias, really looking at our food system and understanding what that looks like and how we can actually improve upon that. And the importance of providing the foundation for our practitioners, diversifying that practitioner pool, and really being able to support them in their care of patients. That partnership, that's what allows us to do that work. And I think we're well positioned to do it. It's hard work, as you remember. It's hard work, but it's so gratifying to see it come together. And it's really critical in our responsibility that we do. Well, you said that powerfully and beautifully. It is important work. Now is the time. You can see the role for IFM and other partners. And I will say, Amy Mack, you are the CEO to lead this organization into and through this ne next decade. I know that I share the perspective of many, many people that IFM is enormously privileged to have you serving as CEO. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Thank you for the opportunity. Amy, I just wanted to make a comment about uh, something that you were talking about related to practitioners and physicians and really need to, needing to serve more than just their clinical training and skills. And we so often talk about functional or root cause medicine being whole person medicine. And what has really struck me in the year and a half with both the, the COVID pandemic, as well as all of the racial disparities issues being raised and having some visibility is that just like we think about whole person and whole patient, we have to start to think about whole physician and whole practitioner. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't agree with you more. And it's, it is interesting how that concept has evolved, at least in my short four years at IFM. We, we were talking about practitioner burnout. That's the thing we kept saying, practitioner burnout, practitioner burnout. And we um, kept attaching it to the amount of work that they had to do in the EMR, the paperwork, there was so much discussion about it. This last week in JAMA, there was actually an article about um, uh, physician burnout um, and in particular, um, the burnout of female physicians. And in fact, was it related to the work they had to do in the EMR? And what I find fascinating about the study is it, it's clear that the EMR work is hard and it, and it feels like it's not part of the work that they need to have, you know, they should have to do, quote unquote, should have to do. But we as managers and administrators and um, CEOs, we all have to do things, right, that we don't want to do. So it's almost like that's a, that feels a little too easy to say, well, it's because of that. It's about something so much deeper for them. First of all, and you know, I watched this with my dad. Um, each practitioner, David Jones talks about this too, they hold the illness and the health of every one of their patients. They have mm -hmm. to hold it in that moment with that discussion, come in prepared, leave holding more, and bring of them full their full self to their um, to their patients. Um, so there's so there's that piece of it, but 
every physician is also juggling something outside. And I think we often forget to give room for that. We do it in normal work setting. We say, you know, you, you should be done at five o'clock, right? You should be done at five o'clock. Well, we know that many of us are not done at five o'clock and we're juggling family and exercise and things we like to do and other things that we need to take care of and boards that we're a part of. Practitioners are juggling all of those things too. And so in this study, what they said was essentially what, what they were seeing in quote unquote, the physician burnout was really about juggling life. And so we have to be okay with the fact that they're juggling life. We need to come in. Again, it gets to this integration. How do we provide them with the best tool? How do we provide them with the best understanding, the best way of thinking to do their work efficiently, but be able to get at the heart of what their patient is experiencing? So there's actually a talk at AIC um, that Georgia Tetlow um, that is leading, and it really sort of tries to get away from this um, uh, notion that a burnt out physician is in some way a weakness, that in fact, it's not a weakness. It's about somebody who's holding so much and there's sort of giants in that space of being able to hold that much. And I think there is a real role that functional medicine is playing. We've been saying that for a while, finding ways to be able to really show that and talk about that and describe that that becomes part of the ROI of why functional medicine can come into an institutional setting and be meaningful. So I, I, um, I think you actually set the stage, you and the board in 2016 with sort of making physician burnout a part of the strategic plan, a role that IFM needed to play. And what I love is that we are learning and growing in what that actually means. We're better understanding the partnership that needs to happen between the patient and the practitioner, and then the toll that takes on the practitioner and what we can do to provide them more strength in that space. 